Okay, so good evening and uh, welcome to our Learn and Share conference call. I'm Russ Derry. I'm the Director of Education for Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, and I'll be moderating this discussion. The topic for the evening is Neuromodulation for Epilepsy, VNS, RNS, and Beyond. And we're pleased to have as our speaker, Dr. David Burdett, who's an epileptologist with Spectrum Health in Grand Rapids. Uh, Dr. Burdett, can you briefly share your uh, clinical and research interests and, and describe your experience with this topic? Absolutely. Thank you, Russ. I'm David Burdett. I am an epileptologist at Spectrum Health in Grand Rapids. Before I was here, I was at Henry Ford Hospital for uh, 17 years doing the same thing I'm doing now. And before that, a brief stint in the Air Force, and then I uh, did my training in epilepsy at the University of Michigan. So I, although I'm from Tennessee, I guess I am a, um, an honorary Michigander. My areas of interest revolve around medically refractory epilepsy. As all of us know, there are approximately one out of every 26 people will develop epilepsy at some point in their life. And looking specifically at the state of Michigan, it is estimated that between 95,000 and 125,000 people have epilepsy. Two-thirds of people who have epilepsy have their seizures well controlled with reasonable trials of reasonable anti-epileptic medications but that unfortunately leaves a third of people who are medically refractory. Despite our best efforts, we are not able to achieve adequate seizure control. And of course, our goal is freedom from seizures. So it is that group of patients, the patients, those folks who are medically refractory, who are my specific area of interest. And my areas of research vis-a-vis -vis implantable devices for the treatment of epilepsy and neuromodulation have to do with what are the optimal sites for stimulation in specific types of epilepsy. Because although we group everyone under this concept of epilepsy, everyone is an individual. And everyone's seizures will be a little different. And finally, specifically, my most recent research has been in the area of atypical stimulation parameters. And, I, and we can get into that in a little bit, what I mean by that. Okay, sounds great. Well, thanks again for joining us tonight. So um, the precise mechanisms by which neuromodulation works to reduce seizures are still not fully understood. Um, but can you explain the basic principles of neuromodulation and the leading theories as to how it works? When VNS first hit the market, and that's the vagus nerve stimulator as we know, in 1997, I believe, we thought that our goal was to have a seizure stopper. So with the, the vagus nerve stimulator, and after that, the responsive neurostimulator, and more recently, the recently approved deep brain stimulator or thalamic stimulator, the simplest approach is that we can perhaps put electrical current into neural structures and stop a seizure. So that would be ideal if we could have a seizure stopper. Alas, biology is more complex than that. And more practically, what we are doing is neuromodulation. We are modulating those electrical circuits in the brain that are producing seizures. And we are, in essence, interfering with the ability of those epileptic networks to either start a seizure or to allow a seizure to spread. So we call that neuromodulation. Now, how do we achieve that? Well, that is incompletely understood, but there are a few theories. One theory is that 
we know when a seizure occurs that there is excessive excitation of the involved part or parts of the brain. So the brain is prone to firing at an excessive rate. So if we could introduce some current at certain frequencies and whatnot that increases inhibition, then we could perhaps reduce the chance that a seizure could happen. So that is one theory, is that these various ways of stimulating the brain increase inhibition and make it harder for the brain to have a seizure. What is most likely, however, is that what we are doing is we are driving with this electrical current circuits in the brain at a rate that makes it hard for the seizure to keep going. So we're actually interfering with the ability of a seizure to get going and to spread. So that right now is, I would say, the foremost theory as to what we're doing with neuromodulation. Over time, the hope is that the brain will, for lack of a better term, unlearn how to have a seizure. We know that if you introduce an electrical, an adequate electrical current into the brain, we could induce a seizure, actually. We could cause someone to have a seizure. But if we use low currents, then we can interfere with seizures. So over time, we see this gradual reduction in seizure frequency, and that is because, colloquially speaking, what we are doing is interfering with the brain's ability to continue learning how to have a seizure. Over time, we talk about this concept that seizures beget seizures. So if seizures are not adequately controlled, then the brain kind of falls into that adaptable mode of having more seizures. With these neuromodulatory techniques, we're able to reverse that process. Okay. So let's start by talking about the vagus nerves, or about vagus nerve stimulation, or VNS. Um, can you give an overview of the device, um, including the magnet and the latest two models, um, how it works, yeah. and what the surgery involves? So the vagus nerve stimulator was FDA approved in 1997, and it's this little pacemaker that is sitting over the chest wall on the left, and the leads, instead of going to the heart like they would with the pacemaker, go to the left vagus nerve. So it's in the front left side of the neck. And what this vagus nerve stimulator will do is around the clock, it will send a brief current into that nerve. And it blocks the current that is going to the heart. So it's sending those currents into the brain. And your neurologist or epileptologist determines how potent that, how, how much current is put in to the nerve and how often it stimulates. And we know that if you have that so-called open loop stimulation, and I'll explain in a moment what that means, over a period of time, there is a gradual reduction in seizure frequency. And with that technology alone, upwards of 55% of people will cut their seizures by more than half. It doesn't happen immediately, but you see this gradual reduction. Now, even with the early models of the vagus nerve stimulator, this effect, this neuromodulatory effect of gradually reducing seizures was seen. There was also a setting on those older models as well as the newer models of a magnet-activated setting. And what we will do is program a, l a little more current into this so-called magnet-activated setting so it has a little more kick. And anytime the person who has the VNS implanted gets an aura or one of their loved ones is near them and they've gone into a seizure, they can swipe a magnet over their VNS 
and that tells the little microcomputer within the VNS to fire with the magnet activated settings. And those settings are typically a little more aggressive and the hope in that setting is to use the VNS as a seizure stopper. So that little extra kick tries to either stop the seizure or to shorten the duration of the seizure. Now we have two more recent models, the VNS Aspire and the VNS Centiva, and they have yet another twist. It is known that the most common heart or electrocardiographic accompaniment to a seizure is tachycardia. So the majority of seizures, when someone has a seizure, the seizure starts and the heart rate will kick up. It'll kick up faster than it would if you were exercising. So we program that Aspire or Centiva VNS to recognize a, and a rapid increase in the heart rate and we tell it every time you see this happen, fire and try to stop that seizure. So in that sense, the vagus nerve stimulator has the neuromodulatory effect, that open loop around the clock firing. And then we've got this closed loop system. And what that means is it senses a, a phenomenon associated with seizures and then it responds to it. And that is what the VNS Aspire and most recently the VNS Centiva does. So nowadays when someone has a VNS implanted, it is typically either the Aspire or the Centiva. The difference there is that the Centiva has a few more bells and whistles and has the ability for us to program the device and to say, okay, for the next few weeks, we're going to stimulate with this intensity and then we'll, uh, it will automatically increase it as we tell it to. And we can also vary how potently it stimulates either at night or during the day. Okay. And um, just in general, uh, what does the, the surgery involve? Is it uh, outpatient surgery typically? What's the recovery time? It is a very straightforward surgery as these things go. It is an outpatient surgery. It involves two incisions. There's an incision over the chest wall where maybe a couple of inches long, the, uh, the skin is opened and a little pocket is made and this small device is put into that pocket. Then there is a small incision over the left vagus nerve and the wires for the device are hooked over, are attached to the nerve. And then another device is tunneled under the skin in the subcutaneous tissue connecting the two holes. They grab the wires, the far end of the wire that has been connected to the vagus nerve and they pull it under the skin and then close the hole over the skin. They attach the, nerve, the uh, wires to the VNS device, sew that and the person goes to recovery and then goes home the same day. Come back, they will come back in um, 10 days to a couple of weeks to have the sutures removed. So it's a very well-tolerated, straightforward procedure. Okay. So um, what possible side effects and complications should people be aware of and what precautions should be taken? The most common side effect with the vagus nerve stimulator is a little bit of hoarseness. So when you send a current into the vagus nerve, a little bit of that current goes into a nerve called the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which goes to your vocal cords. And if I set the VNS setting fairly aggressively, then you would be talking like this and then it goes off and you talk a little bit like your horse and then your voice comes back when the VNS stops firing. So that is probably the most, or is in fact the most common side effect. And we can adjust the 
the settings so that that effect is minimal to to being non-existent. If someone jacks up the settings to the maximum output current and a very high pulse width, then it can actually be a little, it can be uncomfortable. And so, of course, we don't do that. So uh, that is another potential side effect. If, as far as rarer side effects, if the settings are put quite aggressively and someone is prone, say, to sleep apnea, then it could increase their sleep apnea. But again, we avoid going to such high settings. And uh, there is a physical therapy um, technology called diathermy that is done to break up uh, soft tissues that have been injured, and you're not allowed to use that if you have a VNS because it can interfere with the VNS device. Generally, however, in the vast majority of people, we find settings that are well tolerated and do not produce any adverse effects. Okay. Um, you mentioned the diathermy. Are, are, are there any other exclu exclusion criteria or contraindications for getting the VNS? The only absolute contraindication would be if you have had a vagotomy. So if someone is uh, taking out your vagus nerve for whatever reason, then um, you cannot have the VNS implanted. But otherwise, um, unless you have a known sensitivity to implanted devices, um, which would be exceedingly rare, uh, there are no contraindications per se to having the device implanted. Once it is implanted, then there are a few restrictions, the diathermy, but additionally, the... Um, Oh, MRI scans. So there are certain areas that with MR, current MRI technology, coils can be placed to limit the exposure of the vagus nerve to an MRI scan. And if you have an MRI scan, we turn off the stimulation because the magnet within the MRI scan can trigger the magnet-activated portion of the vagus nerve stimulator. So there are a few MRI-related restrictions with the vagus nerve stimulator, but generally that is not limiting. And many of our patients who have vagus nerve stimulators may at some point go for further evaluation for epilepsy surgery and maybe an RNS implantation. And that can still occur despite their having a VNS. Okay, great. Um, and what has the research shown in terms of outcomes? Um, you've, you already mentioned kind of the re responder rate, but if you could kind of review the, the basic outcomes, that would be great. Yes. What we see with the VNS as well as with all of these technologies is an initial improvement right after surgery. So there will be a post-implantation effect that then they get a, the individual gets slightly worse, but not back to where they were before. And then over time, there is a gradual further reduction in seizures. There was a nice article that was from a, a few groups in Canada and France where they compared best medical practice, so that those were patients who did not have a vagus nerve stimulator implanted, but instead the epileptologist or neurologist tweaked their medications, tried to find the optimal medication for them, and that was compared with vagus nerve stimulation. And what was seen was that with best medical practice, over time, these medically refractory patients did not significantly improve, but with the vagus nerve stimulator, after a year, there was 
a 20 to 25 percent reduction in seizures. So this is very typical of what we see with the vagus nerve stimulator. Over half of people cut their seizures by more than half. Depending on your type of seizure, there is a chance of being seizure-free. It could be as low as a 5% chance if you have very frequent seizures, but in people with less frequent seizures, that may be as high as a 15 to 20% chance of being seizure-free. Typically with the vagus nerve stimulator, what we're looking for is that 55% chance of cutting your seizures in half, and then utilization of the magnet activation to either abort or reduce the duration of the remaining seizures. Okay. Have there been any studies done yet um, looking at the two latest models and specifically looking at the heart rate re responsive feature? There is, th there is ongoing research looking to see if we can get an even higher responder rate, but that data is still in progress. The early indications are that we will likely have greater response to those models. Okay, great. Are there any other improvements beyond seizure reduction that have been noted? Yes. Mo uh, the VNS is approved not just for refractory seizures, but also for depression in the U.S. It is often not reimbursed by insurance companies for refractory depression, but it does have some intrinsic pick-me-up properties. So there is good data to say that it has a clear antidepressant effect. And as we know, if we have medically refractory seizures, the risk of depression can be as high as 40 to 60%. So there is that benefit. And in the same study that I referenced earlier, we see the quality of life of the individuals increases progressively over the course of a year in this study but even longer after the VNS is implanted. So uh, perceived quality of life improves over time with the VNS. Okay, great. Are there any subgroups of patients who are more, like, more or less likely to benefit from the VNS? The three groups of people, the, the three primary groups of epilepsy that have that may prove to be medically refractory and might benefit from a vagus nerve stimulator are focal or partial epilepsy, the group for which this is specifically FDA approved, symptomatic generalized epilepsy or Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, and idiopathic generalized epilepsy. The largest amount of information that we have is in focal epilepsy or partial epilepsy where we consistently see this 55% responder rate. With Lennox-Gastaut syndrome or other forms of symptomatic generalized epilepsy, there is less data, but there are still well-done studies that have again showed about a 55% responder rate. And what we also see in individuals with symptomatic generalized epilepsy, many of whom are on multiple medications and have experienced sedative effects from those medications, we will see that we're able to reduce their medication burden and they will perk up. They'll be more alert and interactive. The group where we have the least amount of data is idiopathic generalized epilepsy. Idiopathic generalized epilepsy is one of our least medically refractory groups, so many of those individuals do not make it all the way to vagus nerve stimulation. Nevertheless, there is a growing body of patients who have unfortunately proved to be refractory to standard antiepileptic medications and have had the VNS implanted.
And anecdotally, many of my patients who are in that category and have had this done have seen significant improvement. In my, again, anecdotal experience, it has been oftentimes at least as good, if not better, than individuals in the other group, but we don't have large population-based data on that third group of patients. Right. Okay. Uh, so what is the typical battery life of the most commonly used models, and how extensive is the process of replacing the battery? And, and when you do so, is um, like say someone's had an older model for a year, are you likely to just replace the battery, or would you upgrade the whole unit to the next model? So with regard to the first question, the battery life is going to vary from person to person. In general, the battery life with the latest models is going to be somewhere between 5 and 12 years, or perhaps even longer. And this will be determined by how aggressively the stimulation is set and how frequently it fires. So if someone <clears throat> has very difficult to treat seizures and requires maximal amounts of current to see that neuromodulus, neuromodulatory effect or to uh, try to stop their seizures, so that thing is just bang, 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 firing all the time, then the battery life may be as short as five years or shorter. For most individuals who are set at either relatively low or moderate settings, then particularly with the most recent Centiva model, we should see battery lives into the double digits. As far as replacing the battery, we talk about replacing the battery, but what we do is we, we replace the entire device. So there is this small device that houses the battery, and the and a microcomputer that senses the heart rate so that you can have the heart rate associated stimulation that counts every time that thing fires so we know how often it's firing based on heart rate how often it is firing on its around the clock firing and how often it fires with the magnet and it actually records and stores the data from the last 15 magnet activations. So there's a microcomputer and a battery. When that battery reaches end of service, we will replace it typically with a newer model because the newer models have more bells and whistles and have little tweaks, if you will, to the programming that allow us to make this device better tolerated and more effective. Okay, great. So can patients with the VNS still have resective brain surgery or RNS or, or DBS at a later time? And if so, is the pulse generator typically removed, turned off, kept on, or does it depend on the individual? It, it will depend, excuse me, on the individual, but I have a number of patients who have a VNS implanted, and for various reasons, we have decided to proceed with either resective surgery, ablative surgery, or uh, implantation of a neurostimulator within the brain. And in those individuals, we have kept the VNS in place. We will turn off the VNS when they have their obligatory MRI scans. Um, as you know, we, we need the MRI scans to look at the brain anatomy. We need a detailed MRI scan in order to plan for stereotactic EEG, which is a, a way of sampling directly from the brain. So during those MRI scans, oh, and the third way we need an MRI scan is if we have a functional MRI to use the MRI to detail what parts of the brain are needed for speech, sensation, and movement. So during those studies, the VNS is turned off. Afterward, though, it is turned back on 
when someone comes in for monitoring, we may turn off the VNS in the epilepsy monitoring unit in order to increase the likelihood of capturing seizures. As those of you who may have been in, ep in an epilepsy monitoring unit know, it is being in an EMU is the one time in your life when we actually want you to have a seizure. So we will oftentimes turn off the VNS during the EMU stay, but upon your leaving the EMU or epilepsy monitoring unit, we will turn the VNS back on. And finally, if it is determined that you need to have the offending part of your brain removed, that can be removed and we do not alter the vagus nerve stimulator settings, at least initially. If someone has an RNS implanted, we will oftentimes keep the VNS going and we may in fact try to adjust the VNS firing parameters or discharge parameters in such a way that it will ideally work in concert with the RNS. Okay. All right, well, speaking of the RNS, let's move on to responsive neurostimulation with the, the RNS, or which is uh, made by Neuropace. Um, can you give an overview of the implantation and operation of this device um, and kind of highlight the key differences between it and the VNS, as well as some key features of the newest model? Sure. If, well, the VNS, as we know, is an around-the-clock stimulator in its heart of hearts. We, we have something to which you can respond, which is the bump in heart rate, which is kind of a surrogate for seizures. What the responsive neurostimulator does is it has a microcomputer, just like the VNS does. In, it's a different microcomputer, but nevertheless, a microcomputer and a battery. And what we do with this NeuroPace device is we want to be able to sense a seizure when recorded directly from the brain and immediately introduce current into the area that is producing the seizures to disrupt it. So a typical scenario is someone who is undergoing a pre-surgical evaluation. And the ideal circumstance for epilepsy surgery is if we can prove that all of your seizures are coming from one part of your brain and we can prove that that part of the brain is expendable and can be removed, and you would be the same person walking out the door that walked in the door were that to happen, then we can either have Dr. Elisevich, Dr. Patra, or one of our neurosurgeons, or one of the neurosurgeons at the number, at a number of level four epilepsy centers around the state, go in and either remove that area of the brain or they can induce a laser through a small hole in the skull and laser ablate that area. And that gives you your greatest chance of being seizure free. As you might imagine, there are a number of people out there who have seizures coming from more than one area of the brain or they have seizures coming from one area of the brain, but that area of the brain is what we call eloquent cortex. It is necessary for them to be who they are. So in that setting, it would be disastrous if we went in and removed or ablated that area because that person would, would not be the same person that they had been before. So in those situations, we will take two leads, two sets of electrodes, and if there are two areas of the brain that are causing seizures, four electrodes on one lead will be implanted over one area. The other lead with four electro, another four electrodes will be placed over another, the other offending area of the brain. And then the outflow from that will go out of the person's skull and be plugged into a small microcomputer that is embedded in their skull. So it's flush with the skull surface and doesn't pooch out. And we teach that microcomputer to recognize a seizure. It turns out that if you record a seizure from directly within the brain or the surface of the brain right over where that seizure is starting, every seizure looks the same when it starts. 
as the seizure spreads, every seizure is like a snowflake. But the onset of the seizure will look the same from seizure to seizure. So we teach that microcomputer to recognize the seizures coming from those two areas or the one offending area of the brain. Once we have really fine-tuned that detection and have the microcomputer detecting the seizures within milliseconds of onset, we then program the computer to say, okay, computer, every time you see this pattern, stimulate the brain with some electrical current and try to abort the seizure or to stop the seizure. So that is what we call responsive neurostimulation. It's neurostimulation because we are introducing current into neural tissue, in this case directly into the brain, in order to stop a seizure or shorten a seizure, and it is responsive because it is in response to the seizure that you have detected with your microcomputer. Okay. And um, how, are, how are the electrodes placed on the surface of the brain? Is that through burr holes or some other mechanism? How, how is that done? It will vary from patient to patient. So in some patients where we're, we, we approach the epilepsy surgery workup with what we call strips and grids. So these are arrays of electrodes that are placed on the surface of the brain. Then a hole needs to be made in the skull that allows you to introduce those strips and grids over the offending areas of the brain so that that person can have their seizures recorded in the epilepsy monitoring unit. Once we've recorded the requisite number of seizures, we'll do some brain mapping, determine if that part of the brain can be removed. And if it cannot be removed, and we determine that the best course of action is to introduce, there's to go with a responsive neurostimulator, then a portion of the skull would be removed, electrodes placed on the surface of the brain, and then an area of the skull removed in the size of the neuropace stimulator, and that will be seated within the skull. And there's a little um, housing device, we call it a ferrule, that is actually harder than the skull that houses this device. So one approach is to put two strips of electrodes over offending areas of the brain, and that would require doing a craniotomy to open up that part of the skull. More recently, we have been doing something called SEEG or stereotactic EEG. That is a way of recording the EEG directly from the brain, but without having to do a craniotomy to open up a larger portion of the skull. With SEEG, it's a very small hole that is placed in the skull, and electrodes are placed through that hole in a stereotactic fashion with MRI guidance. So we will use that same technology in many patients to place these wires for the RNS device. So it'll vary. Some patients need a craniotomy to open up a larger area so that these electrodes can be placed on the surface of the brain. Other patients, it will be placed through a very fine hole and then plugged into the neuropace device. And that decision will be made on a a person-by-person -person basis. And of course, the person who is having the procedure done will have significant say in which approach they would prefer. Okay. And as far as risks of RNS implantation, presumably those are similar to the types of risks you might see with surgery or with resective surgery, or are they less, or can you talk a little they bit? Are, they are in the same ballpark. And the risks, anytime you expose the brain through the skull, are of bleeding and infection. Those are the two primary risks 
and at any of the level four epilepsy centers around Michigan or even outside of Michigan, we pay, we spend a lot of time focusing on avoiding infection and bleeding complications. Okay. Fortunately, both of those are quite rare. Right. And then in terms of comparing it to resective surgery, there's uh, essentially no it is, no risk of um, functional deficits, really. As no, because removed. brain is not being removed. Okay. All right. And um, so what have we learned from the clinical trials and, and other research in terms of seizure-related outcomes for the RNS? We have found that, again, the the holy grail, if you will, is a seizure stopper. And in some patients, we will find that an area of the brain, before a person has a seizure, will start to have little bursts of activity. We call them spikes because they look like a spike when we see the graphical representation of them on an EEG. And if we trigger the responsive neurostimulation on those spikes, then we have the potential to actually stimulate the brain and make it unable to have a seizure. And that happens in 15 to 25% of people, that they will fairly rapidly become seizure-free. In the majority of people, however, what we see is a neuromodulatory effect where the seizure starts and within 100 milliseconds or so, we have sensed the seizure, or the computer has sensed the seizure, and then it stimulates the brain to disrupt the seizure. And in those individuals, we see a gradual reduction in seizures. And the chances of a reduction in seizures will vary from the part or parts of the brain that are being stimulated. So one of the most common types of seizures, for instance, is what we call mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, which is a fancy way of saying that the seizures are arising from the underside of the temporal lobe in the area, in or near the area of the brain called the hippocampus, which is necessary for memory formation. And in stimulating that area, we see upwards of a 70% responder rate that is achieved at four to seven years after that is done, after the RNS is implanted. So there's this gradual reduction hitting about 70% uh, responder rate. Frontal lobe seizures, similarly, we're seeing a 70% responder rate. And frontal lobe seizures are quite difficult to localize when it comes to resection or laser ablation, but we find with the responsive neurostimulator or, or RNS that the, there's a median change in seizures of about 70% and um, that about 55% of people uh, respond. So I misspoke when I said 70%. It was about a 54, 55%. So it is on the, the level of a VNS. Uh, lateral temporal lobe, so we talked about mesial temporal lobe. Lateral temporal lobe, we're talking about two-thirds of people will, have, will be responders. And so it will vary from part to part of the brain with the mesial temporal lobe people doing the best. Um, can you talk about the cognitive improvements associated with RNS and to what these improvements might be attributed? So this has been a very interesting finding. Over time, we see that with people who have this responsive neurostimulator will have significant improvements in their, uh, their word finding ability. All of us, as we age, become a little forgetful. What's that word? It's on the tip of my tongue. And with epilepsy and with higher levels of anti-epileptic medications, those word finding difficulties 
can become increasingly problematic. And one of the ways that we can assess this is with a test that the neuropsychologists use called, called the Boston Naming Test. And it has been found that patients who have an RNS implanted have statistically significant improvement in their scores on the Boston Naming Test, on tests of verbal learning, in tests of visual memory, and in tests of what we call executive function. So those are the, the mind's ability to manipulate complex data. So the, those things that, that make us who we are. Okay. It is still being evaluated why this would happen. One as one likely cause is the reduction in seizures that we see over time with the RNS. There's been some interesting data recently that has shown a correlation between verbal learning in people with mesial temporal lobe epilepsy and the rate of spiking. So anyone who has an epileptic network within their brain if that network starts bang, 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 firing on a repeated fashion, that's a seizure. Every now and then, that network or an associated network may just, boom, fire once, in which case it is, uh, it will cause a blip of activity that we call a spike. And we find that with this chronic stimulation, with the responsive neurostimulator, as spiking goes down, cognition and uh, neuropsychological function goes up. So it's been groundbreaking in that sense because previously we thought everything was tied to seizures, but now we're seeing that the spike rate also plays a role. Okay, interesting. Um, and similarly with the VNS, what, what's the procedure for replacing the battery? Is, um, and is the model just upgraded again as you would with the VNS if, if uh, the battery has, has run out? Exactly. We will. Uh, it'll. Uh, there will be new bells and whistles. So we and the housing device. Everything will fit into the same housing device. So it's very straightforward. Okay, but um, you would not need to open up the skull again. You would just be um, removing it. From ah, the yes, that that is a good point. You do not have to open the skull again. Instead, the neurosurgeon will open up the scalp to to expose the RNS device. They unscrew the leads, take out the old device, put in the new device. Obviously, in the operating room, in a sterile setting reattach the electrodes, so put in sutures, close the scalp again, home the same day. Okay. Is there any circumstance under which you might change where the leads are placed on, on the brain or the electrodes are placed? And if so, why would you do that and what would it involve? We may. There are a few situations that we may run into. Oftentimes, Epilepsy or seizures are more complex than we would like for them to be when we're starting an evaluation. There was a neuroscientist whose name escapes me who once observed that if we were, um, if the brain were simple enough for us, to, for us to understand, we would be too simple to understand it. So we are always trying to approximate an understanding of the brain and specifically of the epileptogenic network or networks that are causing someone's seizures. There are times when we may find that the epileptogenic network is more complex than just having two key nodes that we can implant. We will often find that there is one node that seems to be really driving the system, but then there will be a secondary node that every now and then develops a mind of its own, and then there might be a third, fourth, or fifth node that at the time we're evaluating the person seem to be minor nodes, but could become an issue over time. So many of those individuals will have anywhere from 
the two leads implanted up to six or seven leads implanted. Now, with this device, we can only plug in two leads to the microcomputer, to the RNS device, with the current model. Future models may have four or more such ports, but right now we're stuck with two ports. So if we have implanted five leads, we will have the two most active leads plugged into the RNS microcomputer, and then the three other leads will exit the skull and will be, will be left under the scalp right near the RNS device. And if necessary, then the neurosurgeon can go in and unplug one and plug in the other. So that would be the most common scenario with changing leads as opposed to replacing them. It would, because the RNS device is right there in the skull, the chances of a lead fracturing are quite low. So it would be very unusual to have to replace a lead. But if, say, a person was found to have seizures coming from one hemisphere, but then over time they developed seizures from an, the opposite area of the brain, and that area of the brain was not covered with the RNS, then there, are a chance, then there is a chance that you would need to take out the previous device and then re-put in electrodes. That's a pretty rare scenario, though. Sure. Okay, um, and can you talk about um, can people with the RNS still have resective surgery or VNS at a later date? Yes, so the more we see of RNS and VNS, they do seem to work in a complementary fashion. So a number of my patients who have RNS have a pre-existing VNS and we will try to use them in a complementary fashion. And that, of course, is VNS first, RNS second. But if RNS is in place and this person appears that they would benefit from a VNS, that is not an issue. So neither of these is a contraindication to one another. As far as resective surgery, one of the beautiful things with the RNS device is that once we have fine-tuned the detection, then the current RNS device can save 12 minutes worth of information, and we can tell it what to save. So I can say, I want to save 30 seconds of brainwave data, of EEG, and I want to only save every time this individual has a seizure. So I could save up to 24 seizures, in which case I would know, I could see the brain waves from the seizure, I would know the exact date and time that those seizures happened. So if someone, say, has seizures coming from both of their temporal lobes, the most common type of seizure, and we have an RNS lead in one temporal lobe and one in the other temporal lobe, and over time, it turns out that 90 plus percent of seizures are coming from just one temporal lobe, then what we will do is go in and do temporal lobe surgery on that side and leave the RNS implanted on the other. So that is one of the very nice things about the RNS device, or, and for that matter, the VNS, that they do not limit other approaches to treating our patients. Great. Okay. And can you talk about the benefits of the continuous data recording offered by the RNS, um, both for the individual patient and for our overall understanding of epilepsy? This is an area that, in my mind, is one of the most exciting areas of the RNS device because once we have fine-tuned or dialed in that seizure detection, then I can get accurate seizure counts with regard to the date and time of day of every seizure that that person happens. And that has yielded 
extremely helpful information on an individual basis as well as a population basis. So we will see, for instance, that if someone has frontal lobe epilepsy, that the majority of their seizures may be occurring between 11 at night and 3 in the morning. And we can track this data. And if we are seeing this, then this allows us to adjust our medication regimen, that person's medication regimen, in order to maximize the effect of time. So you would top load their medications at bedtime so that you really treat those seizures that without the RNS device we might or might not know. Other aspects that we're seeing is there a growing body of data that if we track the spiking rate of the area or areas of the brain that we are treating with the RNS device, that if we start a new medication, that within a week of starting that medication, if the spiking rate goes down significantly, there is a good likelihood that medication is going to work. Whereas if the spiking rate doesn't budge or, God forbid, goes up, that medication is highly unlikely to work. So these sorts of correlation are giving us insight into the interplay between interictal or between seizure spikes and the treatment of seizures themselves. Wow. And how, how is that data transmitted and, and to whom is it transmitted? So every person that has an RNS device implanted is sent home with a laptop computer that is given to them by the, neuro, the folks from Neuropace. And this computer is, in fact, a medical device. It does not have Wi-Fi access. We cannot get on there and uh, play video games or access the Internet. It only allows communication through a, uh, a hardwired cable. You plug it into your, um, your Internet router and it will sync with a mainframe computer that is out on the West Coast called the Patient Data Management System, or PDMS. And that is the only thing that it will interface with. It will send data to the PDMS. So what data does it send? Well, with one of the, the ports on the side of the computer, you have, you're sent home with a, a small wand, we call it, this device that when held over your RNS generator will interact with it. So you plug your wand into your computer and you hit the button that you want to upload the data. You put that over your RNS device and everything that is in the RNS's computer, up to 12 minutes of data, is downloaded to your computer, which allows the RNS to remember another 12 minutes of information. And you do this on a daily to every other day basis. basis. It's a fairly quick version. It takes a minute or so to download all of that information. So. About once a week, you then interface with PDMS, which sends all of that EEG information to the patient data management system, where I or whoever your epileptologist is can then log into the computer, and I can see how often you're seizing. I can look at your brain waves, and it is... A, it has been a boon to my existence, this PDMS interface. Uh, it, um, uh, anyway, it, it's, it's just, as, as we had said earlier, the information we get from those brain waves is extremely helpful in the defining where we go in the treatment of patients and that has to do with transmitting that data to the patient data management system. Right. Wow. And yeah, I mean, and just uh, self-reporting of, of seizure frequency is on its own is is notoriously unreliable. So I would imagine that's a huge benefit on its own. But then you add all these other benefits that you've mentioned. It's it's uh, pretty impressive. So. It is. Yeah, there's good data to show that 
anyone having seizures is only going to be aware of a fraction of their seizures. And so to be able to accurately quantify and know the date and time of these seizures is very helpful. Right. Okay. So uh, earlier this year, the FDA approved deep brain stimulation or DBS therapy for epilepsy. Can you give an overview of this therapy and, and when you expect it might be available for patients at comprehensive epilepsy centers? Yes. Uh, in April, late April of this year, the FDA approved the deep brain stimulator. Uh, specifically, it's stimulating a deep structure within the brain called the thalamus. And this was approved for the treatment of uh, refractory, medically refractory, focal or partial onset seizures in adults. So right now, we do not have our FDA, we do not have our stimulation device yet. This technology has been available for a few years in Europe, but for the U.S., Medtronic is designing a specific deep brain stimulator for seizures. They have done this for years, as has Boston Scientific and a few other people, for the treatment of the tremor associated with Parkinson disease, or essential tremor for that matter. But with DBS, or deep brain stimulation for epilepsy, they're going to have a different stimulator. We are hoping that this will be available within the next one to two months. And this sort of stimulator will be akin to the vagus nerve stimulator. So it will stimulate around the clock. You'll tell it, I want it to stimulate the thalamus once every three minutes for this duration for five seconds with these stimulation parameters. And what will be stimulated is a deep part of the brain called the thalamus. And what this will be designed to do is to interrupt seizure activity that is happening in the brain. There have been a number of studies that have shown that seizures that occur in the cortex, not deep in the brain, seizures occur away from the thalamus. So they are out in the outer parts of the brain, but there are copious connections between the cortex in the outer part of the brain and the deep part of the brain, a.k.a. the thalamus. And if someone starts to have a seizure, the, as the seizure spreads, it starts to bombard the thalamus with repetitive activity from the seizure. So the thalamus actually plays a role in how the seizure starts and how the seizure spreads. So if we can introduce current to appropriate nuclei of the thalamus and the nucleus that is now FDA approved is something called the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. If you can stimulate that at regular intervals, then you will be able to not interfere with the brain's ability to function as it normally would when we're thinking our loft thoughts, but it will interfere with the ability of the brain to go out of control in a given area and have a seizure. Okay. Um, and then as far as the actual, um, I, I know some of this will depend on the device itself, but is the device, it's the generator and battery, is that uh, implanted in the chest again, or is that implanted in the skull? Or um, And then obviously there's, are there depth electrodes uh, that go to the thalamus? Can you explain what the <clears throat> what the surgery will likely involve? So the surgery will involve depth electrodes placed through the skull on each side. So if you put your hand at the very top of your skull at the vertex, uh, a couple of inches to either side of that, there will be a small hole placed, and then an electrode will be placed stereotactically with MRI guidance into the area of the anterior nucleus of the thalamus on both sides. So that will require making a small hole in the skull and implanting those electrodes. 
the other end of that electrode will be tunneled under the skin to the upper part of the chest wall on the right where it will be plugged into a small device that will be similar to the pacemaker, if you will, of the vagus nerve stimulator. Okay, great. Um, so uh, the decision of whether to pursue resective surgery, VNS, RNS, or DBS depends on a number of patient variables and preferences. Um, can you kind of summarize the basic flow chart that, that can help physicians and patients determine which, appro uh, which approach might be best? Absolutely. So step number one, are your seizures medically refractory? If your seizures are well controlled with medication, then as a general rule of thumb, I would argue, it is better for your seizures to be controlled with medication and with your brain fully intact and without any hardware in your system than it is for your seizures to be controlled with your part of your brain resected or uh, hardware, I'm sorry, in your uh, system and uh, still on medication. So generally speaking, we want to have you control with medication, but we know that's not possible in a third of people. So we ask, can in those medically refractory folks, can your seizures be localized? Can we say that they're coming from one or more areas of the brain? If not, then our recommendation would be to go with either a vagus nerve stimulator or a deep brain stimulator. Until we figure out the vagaries of or the ins and outs of the deep brain stimulator, we're probably doing the vagal nerve or vagus nerve stimulator. Uh, but either that or the VNS will be the way to go. If, however, we can say, ah, this person has epilepsy and it's coming from a network that is in, say, one area of the brain. Okay, we next ask, okay, is it safe to reset that part of the brain? If the answer is yes, then we would ask, okay, if we do brain mapping, does that person need that part of their brain to be who they are? If the answer is no, then is that person interested in undergoing a resection or ablation? If the answer is yes, they would have resected or ablative surgery. But let's say anywhere along the way, let's say it is not safe to resect, that the risks outweigh the benefits, then we would look at more than likely an RNS system. Let's say that it's safe to resect, but it's eloquent cortex. If that part of the brain were removed, they might have weakness on one side or might not be as quick in their thinking, then we would not want to take out that part of the brain. We would do an RNS or maybe a, a deep brain stimulator. And if that person says, you know, I like having my brain fully intact, I'm not ready to make that leap to epilepsy surgery, we would go with an RNS. That's with one area of the brain. Let's say you have two areas of the brain that are causing seizures. We're going to go more than likely with an RNS device. Uh, and if you have three plus areas of the brain that are causing seizures, we're looking at a VNS or a deep brain stimulator. So it's it's the, that's a lot of verbiage there. It sounds rather complicated, but I would say in summary, if we can take out or ablate a part or parts of the brain and you would be the same person walking out the door that walked in the door, then uh, we will go with straightforward epilepsy surgery. If the answer to that is no, or you're not interested in one of those, we're going to look at one of these three things, VNS, DBS, or RNS. We'll go with RNS if we have one or two well-defined areas of the brain that are causing the seizures. If these seizures are more diffuse, we're going to be thinking VNS or deep brain stimulation. Great, great. All right. So, um, what are some possible advances in the neuro in, in terms of neuromodulation on the horizon, both in terms of new devices and therapies, and advances in the existing ones? So, I will start with advances in the current ones. We'll start with VNS. With VNS, 
We have already seen advances with regard to the cardiac sensing of the the increase in heart rate associated with seizures, and we will no doubt continue to see advances in this area. Uh, there are over 20,000 possible stimulation ways to stimulate the vagus nerve and we're going to there is research looking at some ways that the VNS can stimulate the nerve uh, ways that we have not really investigated before so we're going to see advances clearly in that with deep brain stimulation initially it's going to involve around-the-clock stimulation but in the not too distant future, we will start to see some detection software so it can detect what's happening in the thalamus and it will be similar to but not exactly the same as the what we see with the RNS. But that is likely to be years in a few years in the future. With regard to the RNS system, the advances that we expect are going to be an increased ability to save more and more information from the brain waves as they're recorded. With the first iteration of the device that came out in about 2013, we could save six minutes worth of information. With the new device that came out in, in May of this year, we could, we could save 12 minutes of information. It is likely that the next device that will come out in the next five to ten years will save even more information and will allow us to have four leads instead of two leads that can so that we can stimulate four areas of the brain. So that is what we are projecting will occur with the existing technologies. Then there are also a handful of technologies that are less invasive and are, are being evaluated in an ongoing fashion to see if we can modulate the brain and reduce seizures without perhaps permanently implanting something. Uh, examples would be transcranial direct current stimulation. This is an interesting area that uh, is being evaluated by the armed forces to try to increase the um, the acuity of the, the the quickness of thinking of soldiers, and there is some data to show that if you introduce direct current through the skull, that you can activate portions of the brain. If you activate them too much, you can actually cause a seizure. But research is being done to see if transcranial, this, this direct current stimulation could be used in a sub-threshold fashion to make an area of the brain or a region of the brain less likely to have a seizure or impervious to seizures. But that's fairly early in the investigation process. There's been more evaluation with magnetic stimulation. And once again, if you overstimulate with a magnet um, the brain, you could potentially cause a seizure. But if you find that sub-threshold stimulation or do bang, bang, and hit, do this, two, this double hit, you can make the part of the brain that you're stimulating impervious to seizures or at least less likely to have a seizure. Uh, people have looked at trigeminal nerve stimulation. The trigeminal nerve subserves facial sensation. And similarly with the vagus nerve stimulator, trigeminal nerve stimulation, we believe, will, may have anti-epileptic effects through the thalamus. So we see this uh, recurring theme of the thalamus being a way that we can reduce seizures. So there are a number of these technologies that over time we hope will have a neuromodulatory effect resulting in the brain becoming progressively less epileptogenic over time.
Great. Well, that's it. that's exciting stuff, and it is really interesting to see where we'll be in five or ten years uh, from now. So thanks so much. I think we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions, and I do want to remind people, um, if you have background noise, please mute your phone, um, and uh, we will. I'll go ahead and put it in question and answer mode. Just a second. Anyone have a question to get us started? Um, goes back to the RNS. The question was asked. I'm not sure if it was answered, but the surgical procedure that's involved. What was that? The surgical procedure will vary from person to person. If someone, for I guess instance, how long? Sorry to interrupt, Doctor yeah. Verdad. It's more about um, time frame. Like it's not. I. I assume it's not outpatient. That's what I was more asking. Oh, uh, yeah. So this would be an inpatient procedure. Uh, the first step is to figure out where you're going to implant it. So usually that's going to require some form of intracranial monitoring. Uh, once that is huh? done, it depends oh, yeah, there's no one the what sort of monitoring was done. Occasionally, we will do intracranial monitoring at the time that all of the electrodes are taken out, then Dr. Ella Savage or Dr. Patra will hear, well, the same day electrodes are removed, put in the, uh, the RNS device. There are situations, however, where uh, someone where, say, someone has been implanted for a long period of time, we're concerned about infection, and we will wait four to six weeks. So that ends up being on a case-by-case -case basis. The majority of people, uh, there is a lag time that you wait four to six weeks from the time of their intracranial monitoring. And if intracranial monitoring is not done prior to... Right, so let's say hypothetically someone had previous epilepsy surgery. We do a, a phase. Scary, by the way. I know. Uh, so we do a, 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 a phase, we repeat a phase one. All seizures appear to be coming from, say, the posterior margin of a resection. Then uh, that person would likely not require repeated monitoring, and so they could come in at any point there. Uh, there would be no lag time and have everything implanted. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah, Robert, yes. Question for you. Uh, long time no see. It's Ryder Raymond. Oh, Ryder, of oh. course. Of course. Yeah. Now, I'm wondering as well about the RNS. Um, I don't know if it had been in your file as well, but I've got lesions, I guess, on both the left and right side of my brain. Um, so I don't know if I would still be a candidate for that or if the preference be for uh, maybe the one that was uh, shown back in May of this year. So generally speaking, if someone has two areas of gliosis, gliosis is our fancy term for scar tissue on the brain, um, then uh, the odds of seizures coming from just one of those areas is relatively low. So probably taking out a part of the brain is not going to be the optimal way to go. And what we will do is we think that these individuals are the ideal candidates for an RNS. So once again, we might not even do the intracranial monitoring with the electrodes within the brain, and we yeah. might go straight to RNS implantation. If we did that, we would likely do um, what we call stereotactic implantation of electrodes and go straight to RNS. But the situation you're describing with uh, sclerosis or gliosis on both sides of the brain as long as we show the seizures are coming from there, that's an ideal situation for an RNS. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Another question? Hey, Dr. Burdett, this is... Go ahead. Yes. Sorry, this, is, this is Catherine Rays. I don't know if you remember me, Dr. Burdett, but... Um, yeah. I had 
my DNS, and it was made from Cyberonic. So, um, back in 2003, then um, it was replaced by the smaller one in 2009, still mm -hmm. Cyberonic. Then the um, one. We just got a significant uh, weather. In 2013, or excuse me, 2015, and um, what I want to know is since the RNS, what's the difference more or less between the VNS and the RNS in my condition since I'm still taking um, my medication and have a VNS? Or is the so, RNS more for people for, with more seizure types or... Yeah, I would say the, the VNS is going to be most helpful when you have multiple areas of the brain that want to have a seizure. But actually, the, the beauty of the VNS is it is similar to what I would call a broad-spectrum anti-epileptic medication. So if you have one area of the brain that wants to have a seizure, the VNS tends to be quite helpful. If you have two areas, three areas, four areas, whatnot, VNS can be helpful in all of those scenarios. If, however, VNS has not resulted in adequate seizure control, then what I would do is I would want to know, are your seizures coming from one or two areas of the brain? Or if it was coming for three, from three areas, could one of those areas be removed? And if the answer to any of those is yes, then you would be an ideal candidate to have an RNS implanted in the one or two offending areas. The third area, if it were there, could be resected or ablated. And then you would have the benefit of both an RNS that is directly fighting the area having the seizures with that effect being helped by the VNS that is having a broader anti-seizure effect. So long story short, sometimes I got a little get a little verbose there, and I apologize. But long story short, having had a VNS for years does not make it any more. It does not make it difficult to go with an RNS. And if you did that, they could they would work in a complementary fashion. Okay. So many things get updated so much, you know, like cell phones, they get updated and you never know um, what's coming up. Just like that is the very true. RNS. Right. That is very true. So, and as we had mentioned earlier, there are updates coming down the pike okay, on yeah. every, each of these technologies. Right. So we have, we have time for uh, about uh, one or two more questions. Yeah, Russ? Yeah, go ahead. This is great, Dave. Back in 2003, they wanted to operate on my head, and they said that um, that one side of the brain, they, they said the memory was better on the right side than it is the left side. Can't or, or can't they or, or, or can't they or can't they figure it out before, uh, before the operation? Well, uh, but when you have an operation, one of the key steps in getting epilepsy surgery, and it sounds like you went through a very thorough evaluation, is to figure out, is to get neuropsychological testing. You know, that, that full day or half day of the craziest memory and IQ test you've ever done, it's enough to give you a headache. But we get really good information, and we can find out that maybe your memory is better on the left and worse on the right or vice versa. And it turns out that if your memory is, let's say, hypothetically worse on the right and your seizures are coming from the right, then that means that you would be a good candidate for resective surgery for a surgeon to take out that area of seizure. If, however, your seizures are coming from the left, and your memory is worse on the right, then that would not be a good combination. So that is when we think about this RNS device. Well, they said they said that the memory was it was better on the right side than it was the left side, and if I'd have been operated on, that'd be a basket case. 
Right. And that, you bring up a great point. So when you're in that situation, if things don't line up right, then you don't want to be taking out the better side. So that is where... That is when we think about these three technologies, and your epilepsy specialist can work with you to figure out, would a VNS be better, a deep brain stimulator be better, or an RNS? Mm -hmm. Okay, one more, maybe time for okay, one more thanks. question. Uh, Russ, this is Dave. Yeah. Uh, not to deviate from the topic, but with epilepsy and seizures as a primary uh, focal point, uh, do any of these treatments contribute to the possibility of uh, diminishing Alzheimer's or dementia? If you currently uh, have seizures and you currently have uh, uh, epilepsy. Yes, I would expect that with these three technologies, that it will have no effect one way or the other on Alzheimer's. But as you know, all of us as we age through various aging processes in the brain, our memory is just not quite as good as it used to be. So when you have seizures, if your seizures involve the memory forming part of your brain, then you can have progressive memory problems, but it's not dementia. So dementia, Alzheimer's disease, whatever, is a separate process that may or may not occur in any of us. The beauty of this is that particularly with the RNS, that we see improvements in memory with this. So that isn't going to make it more or less likely that we're going to have dementia or Alzheimer's disease, let's say. But if someone gets Alzheimer's disease and they're starting from a place of bad memory, their memory is going to uh, be significantly affected with uh, the Alzheimer's disease. If, however, your memory is starting at a higher level, then the Alzheimer's disease won't hit you quite as hard. So the RNS system has the potential to improve your memory. And uh, so if, by bad luck, someone did get Alzheimer's disease, they would uh, be less affected than they would have been without it. Thank you. There, just to clarify, there wouldn't really be ever, uh, if someone was um, seizure-free, for example, and wanted the RNS simply for the cognitive benefits, that would not be enough to warrant the surgery, typically, correct? Yeah, thank you, Russ. I exactly. Th this is a seizure-treating device. This is not a memory device. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Burdett. We do have to wrap it up with the with the time, but uh, I want to thank you very much for a, a very thorough and, and broad um, discussion on neuromodulation. And I want to encourage people to um, uh, contact us at Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan if you have further questions. Our phone number is 1-800-377-6226, and our website is epilepsymichigan.org. So thanks again, Dr. Burdett, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.